welcome to another exciting edition of the Energy Central Power Perspectives podcast. As our regular listeners know, in this show, we bring to the podcast booth the movers and shakers in the utility space, decision makers, innovators, and leaders across the world of energy. And highlighting the insights of our esteemed guests, we strive to bring perspective to the utility professional about the electrifying happenings across the power sector today and preview what thought leaders forecast will be creating the utility industry tomorrow. As always, I'm your host, Jason Price of West Monroe, stationed in New York City. Virtually by my side is producer of the podcast, Matt Chester, though he's dialed in from Orlando, Florida. Matt, how are you doing today? Hi, Jason, and thanks as always for the introduction. We've got a good one here today, so you know I'm excited. Matt, we're returning to a topic that's been touched upon in our podcast before, but from a unique angle, and that's electric vehicles and their impact to the utility sector. The EV transformation appears to finally be here, and for the utility professional, that prospect is both exciting and daunting. New charging equipment and infrastructure is necessary. The power demand patterns are shifting, and the anticipated increase in power loads and the need to charge those cars are dominating utility planning processes. But so too are the opportunities for EVs to act as energy storage, demand response, and sustainable assets. More than ever, The rise of EVs is causing the electric power industry and the transportation industry to get intermingled and intertwined. More than that, our guest today suggests that we're on the eve of an electric utility marriage with transportation. I'm not sure anyone on the podcast today will be qualified to officiate that wedding, but I'm eager to dig into exactly what that means. But first, let's pause to recognize our partners who are making today's episode possible. To West Monroe, West Monroe works with the nation's largest electric, gas, and water utilities in their telecommunication, grid modernization, and digital and workforce transformations. West Monroe brings a multidisciplinary team that blends utility, operations, and technology expertise to address modernizing aging infrastructure, advisory on transportation electrification, ADMS deployments, and DER and cybersecurity. To ESRI. ESRI, an international supplier of geographic information, GIS software, WebGIS, and geodatabase management applications. To Anterix, Anterix focused on delivering transformative broadband that enables the modernization of critical infrastructure for the energy, transportation, logistics, and other sectors of our economy. And to Scott Madden, a management consulting firm serving clients across the energy utility ecosystem. Areas of focus include transmission and distribution, the grid edge, generation, energy markets, rates and regulations, corporate sustainability, and corporate services. The firm helps clients develop and implement strategies, improve critical operations, reorganize department and entire companies, and implement myriad initiatives. With such a complex and high-profile topic for the future of utilities, it's only appropriate we make today a supersized episode featuring two guests coming to us from Burbank Water and Power. First, joining us after actually being the second ever podcast guest we had on the Power Perspectives back at the end of 2019 is Lincoln Blevins. As we speak with him today, Lincoln is the Assistant General Manager of Power Supply for Burbank Water and Power, and he's also been a frequent contributor to the Energy Central community. That engagement includes an upcoming piece that he's previewed for us that will soon be published to the community called the California Transportation Electric Utility Marriage. We were eager to bring Lincoln onto the podcast again to dive into this important topic. But as we were setting to do so, Lincoln announced the exciting new role he'll soon be taking on at Stanford University as their Executive Director of Sustainability and Energy Management but we couldn't let him sneak away from the utility space without covering the EV transformation at Burbank Water and Power. And he was kind enough to also tag in his colleague, Joe Flores, Burbank Water and Power's marketing manager, who could carry on the conversation from the forward-looking planning at the utility. Lincoln, we want to congratulate you on the new role at Stanford University. How excited are you to get started? Extremely excited. It is a wonderful opportunity, although it's going to be tough to leave my colleagues at Burbank Water and Power. 
And Joe, we couldn't be more thrilled that Lincoln was able to talk you into joining us and carrying the BWP torch moving forward in these critical discussions. Thank you for being here today. Oh, it's my pleasure, Jason. I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Fantastic. Well, let's get started. Lincoln, you're going to discuss in the upcoming Energy Central Post the requirement that only EVs are sold in California after 2035, a move many in the media painted as a radical and transformative policy was in fact not all that bold. Some might consider that a hot take. Can you expand on what makes you shrug your shoulders at such a mandate? Uh, I will. In, in fact, it, it is a hot take, but at least in California, I see the momentum towards electric vehicles as unstoppable. You look around in Southern California, not only do you see an increasing amount of uh, EV charging infrastructure that facilitates the adoption of EVs, but you're really starting to see a lot of them on the road. One, because they're economical, but two, because people just love to drive them. And that's something that we've done uh, a lot of work to get people in, in the driver's seat of EVs here at BWP. But I, so I, I really do see the momentum as unstoppable. And, and once you start adding volume, you get a virtuous circle of uh, adoption. I'm confident that electric vehicle is just going to be vehicle well before 2035. I think electric vehicles will be the default no-brainer choice, not just from an environmental perspective, but also from a, an economic perspective. Whether or not the EV transformation happens as a matter of policy, of economics, or of consumer preference, the impact to the grid will be the same. And that's potentially the largest increase in power demand that we've ever seen in aggregate. For utility folks, this question dominates a lot of boardroom discussions. So Joe, I want to jump right to the core and ask you, are utilities ready for the wide electrification of the transportation sector? So I'm going to say in California, I think the answer is yes, mostly because I think that the utilities have accepted that they have a critical role in that electrification future. We're going to have new technology that I think that is going to help us create that new way of serving the load that's going to give us this opportunity to do it with, in addition to just putting bigger wires and bigger transformers and other things like that. I really think that we're going to be in tune with the consumer and new products are going to come out in the areas of technology that are really going to help us leverage what we have and build smarter in the future. Yeah. And I can take that too a little bit upstream. I think, as Joe said, there's certainly going to be a lot of transformation at the distribution level and at the meter and behind the meter. But when you look at, at power supply in general, California has done an exceptional job of energy efficiency and conservation over the last number of years. And as a result, a lot of the system, not all the system, but a lot of the system actually has some excess capacity in it where we see the pinch points in that, of course, like, for example, last August blackout. But most hours of the year, we have enough electric uh, supply capacity in California to very comfortably absorb the additional load from electric vehicles. Now, of course, that does get complicated late in the day when solar comes off and, say, air conditioning loads ramp up uh, the neck of the duck, so to speak. But overall, we've actually freed up a lot of capacity on the system through energy efficiency and conservation, and that capacity is waiting to be utilized by electric vehicles. Yeah, Lincoln, you know, we've we really heard that message at the programmatic level of we start to like build out infrastructure here in, in Burbank. And what we've done is we've been able to collaborate with our distribution folks and say, where is the additional distribution capacity located? And that's where we focused on where we want to do, you know, public charging infrastructure first. And what do you think, Lincoln? Are states generally unprepared for the EV transition? Is now the time to start oversizing the spend? What is happening, for example, to the gas tax base and how states will withstand that financial impact? Can you talk about what California and Burbank are doing to prepare? Well, I see this really as a more of a state level question than a local question. And to me, it really comes down to some very fundamental policy issues. 
there are a couple of, of major questions here. One is who is actually making that spend? Uh, is it uh, the public purse? Is it private industry? Is it both? Right now we're seeing both, but I think in every locale there's a question of what the most efficient way is to do that. And then also when you talk about the gas tax base, that raises a really interesting question. How do you replace the revenue that the states use generally to fix the highways that comes from gasoline and diesel fuel tax? I can certainly see a scenario where you have metering or submetering for electric vehicle loads and the tariff associated with that meter has a air quotes fuel tax adder in it to replace that. Uh, certainly you can look at additional road pricing. We all already have a lot of, <clears throat> we call them the freeways, but a lot of them are not free anymore. And I think with the technology getting easier and easier in terms of, of GIS and cellular technology and what have you, that implementing road pricing schemes, I think, becomes a lot easier technologically. Does it become easier politically? I don't know. There are some people would see some big privacy concerns in that. So you could certainly add a, an adder to the electricity that was going to charge electric vehicles on a tariff basis. You could certainly look at more road pricing. But I, overall, I really do think we need to answer that question and implement the answer sooner rather than later. It's a lot easier when we're still at a relatively small scale of electric vehicles. Fantastic. Lincoln, given the advent of EVs on the grid, this often poses a particular challenge to the utilities. I was surprised that you noted that the BWP marketing team has shifted focus from getting efficient light bulbs and appliances in customers' hands to trying to get them driving EVs. So why does BWP see this as a priority? Wouldn't it be easier for the sake of adapting over time if drivers took more time to adopt EVs? I think slower is always easier, but in this case, slower doesn't meet the objectives. When we look at the state of California's greenhouse gas goals, and you look at how much transportation contributes almost half of the amount of greenhouse gases emitted in the state of California, driving the electrification and thus the decarbonization of the transportation sector is absolutely job one from a climate change perspective. And then when we look at the additional electric sales that EVs will generate, everything from scooters and passenger cars to medium and heavy duty trucks, you're looking at a significant increase in energy sales. And when you increase the volume across the system, the cost per unit, the cost per kilowatt hour goes down because you're spreading the fixed costs over a larger volume. Not only does that make it less expensive, to fuel your, your car, but it also drives a lot other trans, uh, electrification objectives, such as building electrification. So when we look at EVs, we see two industries, the electric industry and the transportation industry, that have really barely interacted over the last 100 years. I believe over the next five to 10 years, they will come to increasingly define each other's businesses. Yeah, Lincoln, you know, I, I, I really agree with you that this integrated approach is going to be key. And I think that resource efficiency has the position that it plays is changing. It still has an important role, but now it can actually support EV adoption. And so we had mentioned earlier that you want to be able to create more capacity of your existing system that allows us to then serve the EV load. And that is the evolving role that efficiency now has. So if you, let's say, you know, a simple example is in your home, that if you're able to use efficiency to be able to increase the capacity, literally the panel on your home, now there's the possibility of perhaps adding an electric vehicle without upgrading your panel. And you can scale that up throughout the, the entire value chain. You know, on the utility side, we don't have to add new transformers for a while and things like that. And so we're finding that this whole integrated approach to running the utility, not just breaking down the silos of what's going on in the utility, but partnering with the other players and the, the regulators and the people actually designing vehicles and so forth. 
That's great, Joe. And let's continue that thinking some more. So you're based in California, but not just in California, but specifically in Burbank, which surely brings some unique considerations for Burbank Water and Power. With such a car-centric economy, that's also one of the most eco-focused populations in the country. Does this unique positioning lead to greater challenges with the vehicle electrification for a utility such as yours? You know, I think the opportunities greatly outweigh the challenges. I think the challenges right now is, is literally the capacity to build. And I think that here in California, people in my position, those people that are actually delivering products and services to the consumer, we're in a really great position. So the state has created a carbon market that is driving funding to the utilities to actually build out infrastructure and facilitate the adoption of transportation electrification. So that takes a huge burden off of me to somehow justify this right away to be able to build the investment on the backs of the ratepayers. We can now build it using this outside funding and I don't have to then come up with justification. And I'll tell you why that's super important. You know, here in Burbank, we only have about a 3% adoption in electrical vehicles. That means that we're going to be building this infrastructure that may not get used the next day after it becomes operational. It may take time for the adoption of you know, vehicles in the, in the community to build up where you're starting to see the revenue coming in that you can actually justify it as an investment to serve load. So that's one key area that we, they put us in a really good position. The other is that we really understand our role. We're not trying to create these huge waves of adoption. We're working in tandem with what's going on with the manufacturers of vehicles, as well as the state, to be able to set the condition for adoption to happen. So, for example, you know, we started off with the governor making this move to make all new sales of vehicles to be all electric. Well, that starts to create a way for us that we can then ride here on the local level to echo that information and get people ready for this adoption. And I would, I would add that when you look at what Joe and his team are doing and what our distribution crews are doing in terms of, of rolling out EV charging infrastructure, this is really a, a new business for the utilities. And it's a new way of thinking about what we do in, in, in some pretty fundamental ways. Now, I'll give you one example, and that is you know, Burbank Water and Power has some of the best reliability statistics in the country. You know, we are one of the most reliable uh, utilities in the country, and that's at the feeder level. But as we put out all this electric vehicle charging infrastructure, we have to make a decision, and we really haven't come to ground on this yet, does our reliability promise, our reliability performance, extend out to the handle of that EV charger that has our logo on it? And so it's a, it's a very different way of thinking of building out the system. Putting these EV chargers out there is a brand new thing for our line crews, for our construction crews. And frankly, it's a, a brand new thing for our power system operators as well to start to think of these EV chargers not just as load that drives up, plugs in, and drives away, but also something that ultimately at scale might be used to integrate renewables or otherwise help lower the cost and raise the ability of the, of the power system locally. I want to probe a bit further about this investment decision that utilities need to make around supporting EVs. The utilities are factoring in investments around the Make Ready programs, and with electric vehicle battery technology continuously improving, the concern about range anxiety, for example, may be a diminished concern as the, the industry continues to evolve. So help us understand, how does a utility weigh the investments that it's going to need to make with the potential risk that it may not have needed to make the investment outright. I think there's, there, there's an inherent advantage in the size of the individual EV charger investment. You know, when we think about building a new power plant, for example, that's a one-time, uh, very large chunk of committed capital, whereas EV chargers go in one at a time. 
and uh, relatively speaking, they're, they're fairly inexpensive. So there's a way that we can modulate that investment and, and make decisions going forward on a much more granular level, on a much more unit by unit level than we can with our more traditional infrastructure. But there is, you're, to your point, there, there is a real risk that our planning assumptions are based on our current understanding slash fear of the capacity of batteries and that we're installing EV charging infrastructure to charge batteries that are really only at the beginning of finding range, uh, only at the beginning of becoming a uh, very, very long duration basis. So there is a risk there. I think it's, it's, it's moderated uh, in large part by the fact that these are much smaller, less lumpy investments. But I think you then have to pull back and look at the mission of the utility, or at least this utility, and that is to serve the customer. And this, right now, the customer needs to be served by having charging capacity, charging available to them to catalyze this movement toward EVs, to catalyze adoption and, and a confident purchase decision. Those, those little, every little you know, purchase decision has to be made with confidence, every single consumer. So I think, I think there's a way to, to mitigate the stranded investment risk with the granularity of each investment decision, so to speak. But uh, at the same time, though, I think you have to pull back and say, you know, what are we in this for? We're not necessarily in this to get rich. We're in this to be a catalyst for customers uh, switching over to and, and driving and loving electric vehicles. Yeah, Lincoln. So if I can tag on to that, I think that utilities can embrace the role that they have in this transformation process. And part of that is having the consumers recognize that the EV experience in terms of refueling it is probably not going to be the same experience they have with a gas-powered vehicle. So for example, I think charging your EV is going to be probably more like charging your phone. You're going to do it where you have a lot of idle time rather than an event where you visit the station, you refuel, and then you leave. So when you think about where do you spend long periods of time for the traditional commuter, it is I spend time at home and I spend time at work. And so a lot of the EV infrastructure is going to be where do you have idle time? At the beginning phases, the consumer is looking at it and saying, oh my goodness, I'm, where, do, where can I charge if I get stuck someplace on the road? Oh, they have these publicly available chargers. That's the initial role that we're playing up front. It's kind of the showcase that says, hey, don't worry, we got your back. If you leave home and you need charging, there's going to be stuff available to the public. However, when you start really looking at adoption, the investment is going to be made at workplace charging as part of an amenity for attracting employees and keeping employees and at people's homes. I think that's the reality in terms of like, who's going to be making most of the investment? Is it going to be the utility or is it going to be the end consumer? Well, if, if the idle time is being spent in property or infrastructure that's being controlled by the end consumer, that kind of answers the question of where's most of the investment going to come from. So I think up front, the way here it is in California is that we're able to use this market carpet money that is being filtered down through the state for this first initial investment. And so we don't have to worry about as much about that stranded investment, the risk to the ratepayer. Right now, we're going to be putting in a smaller fraction of the total public charging that's going to be available. It's going to get utilized. But when you compare what infrastructure is going to be at people's homes or people's businesses, I think that's where most of the investment is going to go. And so the utility now has a role of saying, how can I be a great advisor to this company because putting an EV infrastructure and being an operator of EV infrastructure comes with some complexity. If we can take away that complexity, I think they'd be more willing to make that investment. And if we, you know, here in Burbank, especially, we're situated between two major freeways. And so we have, you know, a lot of workers that are driving into the city and a lot of workers that are leaving the city. Workplace charging is an absolute must if we're going to do this transformation process. And if you're commuting from Burbank to, let's say, Los Angeles, which is about 17 miles away, and you don't have access to 
charging at your workplace, then you actually have to have it at your home. And so you're going to be investing in that in your home. And that, and then we get back to the tradi traditional role that utilities play. Hey, we're going to serve the load that's needed. Joe and Lincoln, I want to thank you both for your time today and for sharing your valued insights with our audience. Lincoln, best of luck at Stanford. And Joe, you'll have to carry on the tradition Lincoln started of appearing on the Power Perspectives once a year. You can reach Lincoln and Joe both through the Energy Central community at energycentral.com, where they welcome your follow-up questions and comments. Once again, I'm your host, Jason Price. Plug in and stay fully charged in the discussion by hopping into the community at energycentral.com. See you next time at the Energy Central Power Perspectives Podcast.